and we are live hello uh today is february 19 2017 and i have with with me elena kapulnik and james ernst charles hello everybody hello hello <clears throat> uh, jim take it away oh thank you uh it's really good to be here today with uh, max and elena you pronounce it elena right yes and um you I find you such a fascinating and interesting person and you've been to so many great places and done so many things and I'm going to be asking about a lot of that stuff today and um, I in the third density I know it's very difficult for an alien spirit to be here sometimes so uh, I wanted to ask you what is your favorite density when you do travel where where do you go that you find it most comfortable and most peaceful? I find that eighth density for me is the most comfortable to be in and higher up as well. Anything okay. higher, that is great for me. And I like to go to the Andromeda Council biosphere ships and as well to Girk Fit Near. To me, that felt cool. very beautiful. And the Girkfit near uh, one of the motherships had this healing room with a lot of crystals in it and swimming pools, these natural healing pools. For me, that was very healing and very nurturing. And I also learned about um, history with one of the Yayo on the Girkfit near ship. She said, it's perfectly all right what's happening in history to the people of earth because it's happened before and to reach ascension we must learn how to um clean up our environment and not repeat the mistakes of the past that they did six thousand years ago and before that excellent that's cool can you describe what the density is like uh, or the feeling compared to third dimension dimension uh, higher dimensions, what do they feel like compared to third dimension? They feel natural and beautiful. There's no disease, there's no sickness, there's no um, <clears throat> pollution. Everybody is in harmony with each other. There's no competition. There's no money and there's no job in the sense that everybody does the job that they like, that they're suited for. It's not like you go to menial labor for your job. Like if you want to be a librarian or an archivist, you can work in a library on the higher dimensions because Andromeda Council have libraries as well. They all have knowledge libraries. Even Girkfit Near has historical libraries on their ships where you could learn knowledge and history. And it's you can take as much time as you need. There is no hurry up, quick, quick, quick. You know, there's no such thing on those ships. You you learn at your own pace, at your own comfort. And when others come to learn, you teach, you help teach them. And it's reciprocal, oh. it's equal. Everybody's equal. There is no such thing as lesser, or, you know, higher. You're all equal. Excellent. Oh, I wanted to ask you, um, there for those people that don't know where what planet are you from and what density is it I am from the planet Andromeda that's one of the lifetimes I had and it's in the Andromeda galaxy somewhere and I'm from different planets all over because I've had so many lifetimes so I I've, I've been to Mars that was one of the um, one of my planets, I lived on the original colonies on Mars before the two devastating um, catastrophes that happened there. So that's one of my favorite planets. Andromeda is as well in the Andromeda galaxy. Um, there's many, there's so many. Cool. And yeah. what densities, you've been in several densities then. Yeah, um, Mostly I've been here on Earth. I was in the fourth, fifth density w when I lived with um, the Anshar in inner Earth. I also was in Egypt. I took care of all of the libraries 
thousands of years ago. I was one of the knowledge keepers and the, the guardians of that. And that was fourth, fifth density at those times. Mars, it, what Mars was life on. Oh, go ahead. Mars was also fourth kind of fifth density. When I lived there, I was a gatekeeper of the stargates back then. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to know what Mars was like when you were on Mars, what kind of life was it on Mars? There was humanoid, mostly humanoid prominently, just like earth colonies, but there's also reptilians. There's, um, ant people, there's insectoids. They're originally from Mars as well. Not the warring factions, the reptilians, the healers, the, the, you know, the ones that do terraforming of planets that seed life. So they're still there as well in smaller colonies right. and the humanoids. There's still uh, people on Mars. Are they subterranean now? Yes. The, the original colonists that were there before the catastrophes, they're subterranean. There are still yes. some cities like the military cities of humans who've colonized Mars. They're on the surface in domes and biodomes. Some of them, and some of them are subterranean as well. Oh, very good. Are they still there? Are humans still there? Humans are very much still there. Yeah, their original colonists, humans are there. They were decimated to half of their populations. And they're slowly rebuilding over thousands of years. They're there. The thing is, it's not just the original Mars colonists that are there on Mars. It's the um, military factions of Earth that are also there now with their bases. They have like over a hundred bases on Mars, yeah. the military industrial complex. They've branched out. I heard that. Yes. So yeah, that's, that's not really a surprise to me, but I'm in, in some ways it is because the, uh, the military, we wonder how they got there. Did they transport port there or did they have ships built or how did they get there? They use stargates. They unearthed some of the ancient stargates that are in Earth, like Baghdad. That had a stargate and is transferred to the Cheyenne Mountain. They have a stargate program over there in Cheyenne. Oh. Yes. Um, CERN as well. They're able to open portals through CERN. And um, they also, the military industrial complex, the U.S. part of it, they did start working with the Nazi leagues because the Nazis worked with reptilians. They worked with Nordics. They worked with other ET civilizations to build their own ships. And um, with that help, they were able to reverse engineer technology, ET technology and some of the crash ships as well on this planet. And they were able to get off Earth to Mars, the Moon, and other colonies. They've been able to colonize other planets in the solar system and outside of it. So Excellent. Th yes, I was aware of the Stargate in the Middle East that they had found and were using. But I wasn't aware they had found the, some of the others. They have, yes. Very they found Stargate technology in Antarctica at the poles as well. They found some in um, near the Mayan ruins and locations. They found some in India and in Tibet. They found them all over, like all those ancient sites where there used to be ET presence. They found that there. I know there's supposed to be quite a few of them on Earth. And there's some real big ones and then there are smaller ones. Um, are you aware of if they uncovered any of the really large ones? There's supposed to be like 12 really large ones and a lot of smaller ones. They have uh, found a lot of the large ones. One of the larger ones was in Baghdad. Okay. So they retrieved that. And these, these stargates were in caverns, actually. They were yeah. hidden in caverns and in huge mountain ranges. So it wasn't like it was buried in the sand somewhere out in the desert. There is one near Egypt Very that they retrieved that was buried under the pyramids. So they had to excavate it and transport it. Excellent. 
Is there anything that you wanted to discuss about um, your travels that uh, you haven't been, that everyone would like to hear that they haven't heard yet? Um, the way my travels happen is in three different ways. Sometimes the physical body gets beamed up or teleported through. I have a portal that opens up in my closet, you know, like a water portal, and I walk through it and I end up on another planet somewhere out in the Pleiades. Cool. So it's sometimes, or a physical beam out, like a green beam appears or a blue beam and I'm beamed up to a ship or a planet. There's also telepathic with my mind, mm -hmm. where it's telepathic, you know, like sort of like astral traveling, where I project my telepathic energy out to the out to the planet or a ship, and I'm semi semi there, kind of there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also my um, my light body, which is an actual energetic semi corporeal body that travels. My body is here. My physical body is at home. It's fine. But my light body and part of my consciousness leave. And I'm just able to transport myself that way anywhere I want to go. Anywhere. Wow. I don't, I don't consider that astral travel because almost all of my being goes with the light body. There's a bit of my consciousness that stays in the human body to maintain it. But the rest of it goes out there in that light body which is half corporeal and it just can appear anywhere at once on a ship on a planet oh, that's great or even float out in space just float in space and look at things and observe and do whatever it does out there so those are the three ways now I have you been called on to do missions yes sometimes i have been called on to do missions um the harp program in alaska they were going to cause two earthquakes um, last year. And um, I was asked to disarm their new laser technology to stop them from firing off the new laser to cause the earthquakes. One was going to be in Alaska and one was going to be a huge earthquake in California. Whoa. Yes. Yeah, so now, I, are I was, you... Are you trained on how to disarm this technology or does it come natural to you? How is it that you're able to do these things? Well, I was in the secret space program, so I had training of various advanced technology and such from that time. Um, all I was supposed to do when I went to disarm the harp technology, I was just to call on um, the plasma energy from the ionosphere the energy, I was just supposed to call down the energy, the plasma, harness it, and just blow up the laser. Just blow it up. Wow. And that's what I did. And it took them a year to rebuild the thing. Wow, that's incredible. Um, it must be wonderful to be able to do those kinds of things and help humanity. And um, I'm just wondering... Um, you were in the space uh, secret space program too, uh, and you did a lot of training there. Yes. Um, did they send you out to do these missions, or did the aliens send you out to do missions? The the secret space program has their own agendas. I was mainly stationed on Mars. I built advanced ships. I built um, technology to be able to do translation work. I worked in information centers to, they'd send information to me about all of the stuff they recover, ancient technology, stuff like that. I'm to collate it, translate it, and enter it into the databases. So I think that was more self-served, the work okay. that I did with them on Mars. The work that I do with the ETs, that's for humanity, to help humanity. Excellent. That was one of the heart projects to disable that. That was the ETs gave me the information and I was to disarm it so they wouldn't cause the earthquakes. So um, some of it is what I'm doing now. It's for humanity and to help the secret space program was, you know, it's their agendas. Now um, there's so many alliances out there. Do you work with all of them or do you just work with uh, ones you choose to work with? I know of all of them, but I choose to work with certain groups that I feel more energetically comfortable with. 
if that makes sense. Well, Girk Fignir is one of them. You really yes. are seem to be an integral part of their programs and their ideology. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you do with them? It was mostly healing. I wanted to see what their healing facilities like on their ships were. And when I was there half a year ago, that was the last time that I, I, I went there in a uh, holographic body, which is my light body, we could say. I went there in my light body, um, which some people will understand as holographic bio, you know, biolocation. That's the best human words I could give it. Um, it's, it's not biolocation, it's by location. But the, by yeah. location, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, so when I was there last, half a year ago, they had um, a reptilian kind of um, being and also a human augmented being from the Cabal that were retrieved from one of the ships that were destroyed that was traveling near Victoria, off of Victoria. Um, and they were decontaminating them in these bio tanks with this living matter to remove all the nanotechnology from these two guys and to remove all of the programming because they didn't want to be in these in the, these cabal groups anymore or negative ET based programs, the reptilian, fully reptilian male and the augmented human man that had ET features because he had been changed and he no longer wanted those changes. So Gurk Fitnir um, offered to take on those two to, to heal them. Um, wow, great. Who shot them down? It was or the who? Andromeda Council, the main primary biosphere. They shot oh. them down, but they didn't want to take on the responsibility of, you know, rehabilitating them. Rehab. They didn't want to do that. So Kirk Fickner uh, offered. They shot them down because uh, why did they shoot them down in the well, first place? They they shot them down because they wanted th this this sh this reptilian ship with uh, a few human cabal traveling with them. They wanted to destroy one of the natural Stargate portals that opened up during the Lion's Gate. Oh. The, yeah, during the Lionsgate phenomenon, um, this huge portal opened up and in the Rocky Mountains, so they were traveling to destroy that natural portal. And that Can portal you... needed to be there for the earth, for the for the balance of the earth. So they needed it to be shot down. The ship needed to be stopped. Shot, so they shot it. For those that don't know, can you just tell us what the Lions Gate phenomena is? Um, every couple of thousand years, or even a couple of hundred years, you have natural energy waves coming to the planet to Earth Correct. to open up stargates, rebalance the ionosphere, the magnetosphere. So, and this energy wave came in. And it activated about six portals, natural portals on the planet. One of the main ones was near the Rocky Mountains. So that's wow. what the Lion's Gate was. It was this particular one was called the Lion's Gate because it was one of this energy would open up some of the major portals. That's why it was called Lion's Gate. Excellent. Thank you. Because uh, um, a lot of people may not know what that is, and that's a good ex explanation. Thank you. And um, are there any? Uh, have you been working with any of the portholes or vortexes on Earth? I have. Yes. Last year I was. I was are they in good shape, or um, do we need to worry? Um, the cr the huge crystal obelisks from inner earth are balancing the portals and maintaining the portal system ways the natural portals because there's also the, the, te the technological portals which the governments run um the anshar has some technological portals as well that they are caretakers for and those work just fine the natural portals are balanced by the crystals very cool. I know that there are those on Earth also that are creating portals for safety's sake for the 
for humankind, like the uh, vortexes along the uh, the coast of California to help it stay stable and things of that nature. But I was just wondering your involvement with them. Um, I wanted to ask are you? Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I started working with with uh, small local geographic vortexes. And uh, right now I have just intuitive ideas what to do basically to meditate and praise them, basically do a, a, a ritual praise in the vortex. Can you give any more specific, uh, Elena, can you give any more specific ideas how to relate to the vortex and what to do with them, like with natural vortexes? Well, to keep them um, aligned and centered, you know, balanced energetically to help funnel the energies of the planet in a balanced way many go out with crystals they leave offerings and crystals around the vortex and crystals help to balance the energy mm -hmm. so doing crystal work taking a few crystals to the known vortexes the natural ones that you know of and doing a some kind of a prayer a meditation even holding a meditation circle with um with people that you trust that are energetically balanced for that type of work with the crystals will help to fine tune those vortexes and portals to keep them aligned. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So crystal gridding, crystal gridding around the vortexes really rebalances the grids, grid systems, because all of these portals are connected to the, to the energetic grid of the whole planet. It's like, little grid yep. points connected to higher grid points, these vortexes. So crystal work, meditation, that all works like at the site itself. If you could mm -hmm. go to the actual physical site and do that, that, yeah. that helps it even more. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, you wanted to continue, you had another question. I have questions on, on different topics. I just wanted to, to plug my question here when, when we were on the water. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Jump in whenever you want to. That's Thank fine. Um, I mean, I'm really enjoying our conversation, so it's it's really nice. I, I wanted to ask, too, I know that regular people can help with the vortexes as well if they, if they are aligned properly and uh, use the proper uh, crystals and things of that nature. They can also help encourage the vortexes to uh, keep moving properly. So that is a good thing. Yes. But I wanted to move back into this, uh, the into outer space because this is something that I'm very interested in because I don't get to travel there, but you've been there a lot. Uh, what other planets have you gone to uh, that are really interesting, and what were they like, and uh, I'm very interested in other planets and off-world activities. Well, recently I went to a planet called Sagaya, S-I-G-A-I-A. -A. Um, they have a sad situation there right now. I helped, I gave some positive energies. They have plasma beings living on Sagaya that were taken over by the Archons, unfortunately. And there's this huge green energy field around the planet right now. They have about three different species of the plasma beings on Sagaya. So right now they're trying, apparently they're archons because they, they are energy, right? They can take over living beings and it's easier for, for them to take over plasma beings that are almost pure energy. They feed on that plasma and t take over because they're entities. It's like almost like entity possession. So I sent some positive energy to them to, to, to force the Archons out of the plasma beings. It was a sad situation, but the planet itself needs a lot of rejuvenation because the original uh, flora and fauna has been damaged on the planet with this green substances, this green goo that's around the whole planet. They're basically isolated. They've been... It's, it's a bad quarantine, I would say, that the Archons did. So their, their planet is almost dying. So I went there to, to give healing energy to that planet to remove the Archons. And I don't remember which solar system this is, but the planet's, the planet's core energy is called Aranda. A-R-A-N-D-A. Um, so 
I gave it some healing energy to help them remove the archons. Because it was once a beautiful planet with with a lot of forests and lakes and rivers and plants, and now it's almost barren because of the archons and the misuse of the um, plasma beams. Wow. So there's wow. That's un, wow. Yeah. Um, what did the plasma beings use for substance? They energy. They use the natural energy of, of their planet. And for them right now, they're malnourished because the energy is so polluted with this goo, this green goo in the atmosphere. So they're almost starving. Their food source has been cut off. So oh. they're, they're starving. Is there anything that any other planet can do or any other species can do to help them out? Um, send healing energies. If ETs can physically go there and help to clean up the Archon somehow, that would be helpful for them. I I don't know the specifics. I wasn't allowed to see how the Archon invasion happened. I was just to send healing positive energies, and I spoke with one of their elders, Raoun, um, and I just gave a lot of healing, a lot of good energy um, to rebalance the plasma beings themselves and a bit to the core of the planet. But it's going to take um, a lot of effort to clean up this, this whatever happened on that planet. It's very sad to hear th stories like that about planets that are dying and uh, civilizations that aren't doing so well. But they're, they're all over the place in the universe. So yes. it's, it's sad. Yes. But, is there any other places that you can tell us about that you've uh, gone and helped? Um, I remember one of my fondest memories is going to Tolaris, um, which is a planet in the Pleiades system where I just ran in the forests. It's beautiful. I think it was kind of like sixth dimension. And I just ran in the forest with the forest beings. That was the portal, oh, wonderful. The waterway great. portal that opened up in my closet. I just walked in and ended up on Tolaris. That must have been amazing. How long did you stay there? I stayed about half a day. And then, then, and then I woke up and I had sore legs and arms because I <laughs> ran, I ran, I literally ran because I was physically taken there. So I ran in the forest because their frequency is different. So the energy of the body when you're there is also different. You, you have such vital force in you. I remember this, this beautiful green energy around my body and I just ran, just ran because they run a lot in the forests. Were you able to communicate with them while you were there or did you just, uh, run, did just do the running and the uh, observing? I did a lot of observing, but I saw a lot of women in the forest, a lot of the elders, a lot of the elders who take care of the land, female elders, and oh. I talked to them. Um, they have they have natural portal technology that could heal your body. The waterway portal that I entered through did some healing on me. It's really beautiful. Excellent. Um, and they're th the ones that take care of the land. They're the healers of that planet. They looked. Some of them looked humanoid. Some of them had these feathers on their heads. You know, like kind of because they're the elders, so they're really connected to the land of that planet. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. Sounds like they take care of their planet very well. They do. They do. They don't have any type of cities. Everything is like, looks like huts. Like huts, but it's made out of, I don't know, earthy type materials. Very cool. Are, they could just materialize that and build 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 huts that just blend in with the environment. So there's nothing like cities there. There's there's like little colonies and groups of um, living arrangements, but no huge cities. I see. Yeah. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change gears here for a little bit, and I wanted to ask your opinion on first contact and. Um, 
things of that nature. Uh, what do you think, when do you think that's going to be a, uh, plausible, actually? Well, it depends on the humans, and it depends on our government, and it depends on ETs as well. Yes. How long? How long is the government going to hold this embargo of not telling us about the existence of ETs? That's the first thing that needs to come out. And you know, contact is already being made with many people on the planet. Yes. That's already been done on personal levels, person to person, and groups that are ready for it. So, but I there and there's. You know, there's different sorts of contact. If we want whole planet-wide contact with ETs, this this it needs to be out in the open that ETs are real. They exist. They've been coming here for millions of years. That needs to come out. The information to the public needs to be released somehow. So that's first. Because the when, I don't know. I can't give you a year. I don't know. Everything changes energetically on this planet every second. So, you know, those that want the contact already have it. Those of Correct. us that are energetically inclined to it and are open-minded and believe that there's other life on other planets and in the universe, we already have the contact. We have it. So we don't need to be convinced of anything. We already know the truth. I agree with you 100% that the people that want the contact or can have it um, they can may not be able to have it to the extent that they want it, but they do have it. Yes. So that is, they have the knowledge and the understanding that they exist, and they do have uh, some contact through channeling and other means and some news and UFO sightings and things of this nature. So they do, they do have the information that it exists and that they do exist. It's just that they... Uh, they haven't met them in person yet. Well, I did have a sort of, I guess it was seeing the future of what will happen when contact is made official, you know, official disclosure is made, that ETs are real, the government releases the information at some point, which they will. So there, there are exchange programs. There are exchange programs. The government will set these up. And so those that already know who they're in contact with right now can request to fill out a requisition form saying which ship they want to go on, which species they're visiting, and how they're related to that species. And, you know, they fill out the form, they submit it to the exchange program, cultural exchange program between humans and ETs, and then they can go on the physically travel out from the planet in a ship to that other ship or that other planet with their star family connection to visit their star family connection. So, yes, I know some people that have experienced the fact that they were supposed to go and they didn't go. Uh, they were stopped by the government or whatever, but there has been some that have gone mm -hmm. and have made that exchange. But uh, recently there's been a lot of delays. So I'm not but sure what that's all about. At some point in the future, there will be these physical exchange programs between humans and ETs where, you know, like we have cultural exchange programs on this planet already with other countries, it will be this way with ETs. You, those that already know who they are telepathically in contact with, right, they could fill out a form. The government will have these official programs in place at some point when everything is worked out where you could fill out the form, which planet you want to go to, which species you want to meet, which name of the ship, you know, if you know this information, you fill it out in relation to you. How is the ET related to you? So say, for example, let's play this out, this scenario. Um, I have two cousins. I have two cousins on the Akashan ship, the L, the L ship. So when... A, you know, when this program is in place, I would fill out a form. Ship, where do I want to go? The Akashin. Um, species, L, I put an L. Relation to myself. Cousins. Arena. One of the cousins is Arena. 
So I would put that in, I would put the names of the people and, um, and they'd look at the paperwork. Okay. Well that ship right now, look into their records. That ship is way out there right now. It might take five months to get you there. So, you know, according to the paperwork, they match you up with where you want to go. Very good. How do you get one of those forms? Well, not right now. It's, this is in the future. Oh, okay. When everything has been worked out, these cultural exchange programs will be in place for humans to go to meet their ET family, and the ET can meet their human family through this cultural exchange program. This is a form of the future that I saw. And that's Excellent. contact. That's I know that there, there are some programs similar to that going on without the forms right now that the government is allowing uh, some people to move to go uh, different places for different reasons, but it's very it's uh, very limited. And it's hush hush. We don't know about those programs. This will be out in the open. That cultural exchange program will be out in the open. Everybody will know about it. And they'll have the chance yeah. to fill out those forms to be matched up with the ship where it is or the planet or the species. You know, you know as much as you know from your telepathic communication or the beam ups, but you put it on the form, then you're officially matched up to go there with permission, free permission, free everything. You go there. Excellent. It's all sanctioned. You know, the governments won't be able to eventually, things will change and it will come out. I don't know when, but it will. I'm sure. And these cultural programs it, will be in place for, you know, for humans to, to meet ETs and ETs to meet humans out in the open. I'm sure it will happen. I, I can hardly wait for that day, actually. <laughs> it's, Me too. It's sort of a dream to think about uh, those kinds of things happening. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh. Yeah, I, I want it too. Yeah. Take me anytime I'm ready. Exactly. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, that's a positive thing I saw in a future timeline happening where it was out in the open. Everything was disclosed in every country. The governments have these cultural exchange programs. Right now, if I wanted to go to Spain and learn Spanish, I could apply for a cultural exchange program with to go to Spain and somebody from Spain will come here and do the mm -hmm. same. So it's equal exchange. So that's an example, except this will be off world exchange or, off, or on a different ship exchange. Human goes to the ET ship, ET goes to the human planet to learn from each other. Uh, I just joined the group, which is C5 con Close Encounters Type 5 group. Basically, this is um, uh, the type of Stephen Greer's groups. And um, they're coming out uh, to meditation size campgrounds and uh, invite ETs to show up in the sky. Um, I haven't done it before. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Um, any any new ways of getting that contact? Uh, I guess it's not open officially, but local contact. It's telepathic contact. You say, I mm -hmm. want, you know, if you know the group of the species you want to contact, you say, okay. I, uh, you say telepathically, I would like to have contact with the Pleiadians, this group and this group. The more specifics you know, the better. Uh, which groups would you recommend? I know Girk fit near, but they sort of uh, drug, drug their contact delay because they uh, say, they say they in diplomatic relationships with governments and without the sanction from the governments, they don't want to to risk that relationship. So, well, what other groups would be recommended? Girk fit near. There's a loophole in this. No physical contact, like physical contact, mm -hmm. to risk the you know negotiations. That does not mean telepathic contact can't be made. That can still be done okay. with those groups, the C5, whatever your you know, first contact. Mm -hmm. You can still telepathically ask to have contact with Girk Thick Near. Okay. If you participate in one of these group meditations out on a campsite mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, it's better if it's beside a vortex, an energy vortex, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you you have better telepathic communication actually yes. for your, your request to be approved. So you could say, 
you know to care from Gurk Fitnir. You can say, mm -hmm. Gurk Fitnir, I want to telepathically communicate with to care and I want to holographically go up on the ship. That is allowed. That is allowed. They're That's not cool. physically coming here and showing up in the ship and saying, hello, we're here. Human earthlings, we're here for you. No, that is that's what the you know the negotiations are with the government the physical contact negotiation uh -huh. but telepathic contact is allowed that's allowed okay. yes I, yeah telepathic contact is allowed okay thank you very good all right um i can't see you okay right now i i'm thinking that um, your trips th throughout the universe have to be numerous and you you must have like a sort of a mental scrapbook of all the places that you've been um, is there any uh, species that you think that will be um, we will we'll be able to go to in the future that will be really open f to humans and all their different quirks and things Yes, yes, um, the Andromeda Council, they'll be open because they're Palladian, they're Arcturian, they have, they diff they have like nine different um, members of the council, and most of them look humanoid, and their biospheres have different habitat zones for different species that go and visit them. So they're equipped for first contact, Gurkvetnir as well, um, I would say Pleiadians, Nordics, okay. Tall Whites, those will be, yeah, yell will be the first ones we meet. What is, I would say when first contact happens, the species we'll meet will look humanoid or as close to humanoid as possible. So there is no, no misunderstanding who are you and what you are. Because humans are used to seeing humans, right? So there's no fear or... So we'll be, as I understand it, we'll be introduced to humanoid species first. Okay. Have and you had any contact with the Whale and Dolphin Alliance of uh, Andromeda and slash Pleiades? I've, I've been in contact with the Whale Energies. Okay. Um, the, and I did meet a whale like dolphin, I met a dolphin species and I was shown how the moon will be tractor beamed away at some point because we won't need it. We won't need the oh, moon interesting. orbiting like around the planet in the still motion that it is because it's locked in with, with the earth orbit. The orbit itself yes, that's the moon never moves. We don't see the dark side of the moon. At some point, a tractor beam the dolphin energies with the dolphins when I talked to them, they told me that at some point they have tractor beam technology, the dolphin species, where where they'll tractor beam the moon out from that locked Earth orbit and I'll go outside of our solar system because we won't need it. The Earth will be balanced enough on itself so it doesn't need the the lock of the moon around our orbit to, to balance things. It will be able planet will be able to balance itself without that moon being there cool have you been to the moon and uh seen what's on the other side yes i have been on the moon i was stationed there in one of the programs the ssp programs is, that it are, that, is it true that there's a lot of aliens on the other side that are uh colonizing that side so that they can like sort of look through and observe the earth yes they've they've been there since since the moon came into our solar system, they've been there. So it's already been colonized. There's reptilians, there's all kinds of species out there. They have their own embassies. Yes, that's what I heard, that there's actually uh, a big mix of species, and they're actually negative and positive, and they sort of have a, a treaty with one another not to go into each other's spaces. That is true. That is all true. And no fighting on the moon. No fighting. Otherwise, you're kicked off. Wow. That's interesting. It's neutral, so, neutral meeting territory. Because there has to be a buffer. And at one point, there'll be a buffer on Mars like that. 
they're, they won't be able to war on Mars either. So Very good. It's like neutral Switzerland on the moon. It has to be like that there. Very cool. How many different species do you think are there? 3,000. Wow, that's a lot of different species. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, so they must have a, my, a very small colonies all around it. Yes, yes. They have their, they have their little territories mapped out. And there's human presence on the moon. There's us on the moon as I'm well. Sure. We have a few of our bases and a lot of mining operations on the moon as well in certain locations beside the bases. Limited mining because the moon has a lot of ore and other substances. So there's mining. The moon was origi originally, um, it's like a labor laboratory where there's a lot of um, genetic material. Pardon me. A lot of genetic material stored. Plants, various species, you know, how to seed life on other planets. So it's like a, a laboratory to do that. That's what originally was supposed to be done, but there was a lot of wars in the solar system. So many of their original colonies of the moon, on the moon were ruined. The domed cities were destroyed. I imagine you could probably write a history book about some of the things that are happened in our own solar system. Have you been to any of the other planets other than the moon and Mars? I've been to Pluto and Uranus. I've been to Venus. Um, what are they like? The Venus people are very nice. There, there's, there's old ancient guardian outposts there that are still active, and they're holographically managed. There's also Venusians living on um, Venus, and some of them are blue skin, blue skin. Um, they have humanoid-type colonies there, humanoid species. So they're very welcoming, and they're about teaching and knowledge. Pluto and Uranus, their secret space program base is there. So oh, okay. primarily what's, what's there. Um, there's also that little planet in the, um, in the asteroid belt called Ceres. Okay. There. Are there any, um, is there any life around uh, Jupiter or Saturn? I heard there's some planets there that have outposts and life on the, uh, some of their planets. Or, or some of their moons, I should say. Yes, yes, there are. There's life on the moons. I don't really know much about Jupiter. Um, Saturn, I know the rings of Saturn were once a laboratory. It was a weapon. They're inside the rings themselves. Oh. There's like crystal technology in the ring of Saturn, in the rings of Saturn. There's a ruined lab there with, with a weapon. It's a weapon. The rings that were a weapon at some point. Whoa. A crystalline weapon that was destroyed. Oh wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. But um, how long ago was that destroyed? Do you think, or was it a long time ago? About five hundred thousand years ago, when Maldek was destroyed. Oh wow, very good. Yeah. And um, there is a, a, a superstation near Jupiter and the Ganymede Star Portal. There's a portal. Near Gan the Ganymede, it's called the Ganymede Trading Portal, and it's an actual technological portal in space beside the space station. So oh, is that the one that they call the little, the miniature black hole kind of thing? Uh, sort of. It's not a black hole though. It's just a huge I, I think, portal. Uh, yes, um, Earth looks at it. Uh, the tech, the uh, scientists of the Earth that are just uh, looking at it think that it's a black hole or some of them do yeah but it's so, not a black yeah. hole it's a portal yes it's a natural it's like wow, a, that's very cool. it's like a portal if you ever watch the stargate series it's yes one of those portals and like one of those hanging portals in space so oh, that's here. what it looks like and it's beside the um super confederation space yeah. station that's the space station that's near Jupiter and it's a trading hub that portal it's called the Ganymede portal and it's a trading hub 
humans, different ET species go in and out of it and go to the station for negotiations, trading routes, colonization of planets. That's where those negotiations happen. Excellent. That sounds cool. Do you have any more questions, Max? Yeah, wanted, yeah. About, uh, as you mentioned, the history, like 500,000 years ago and so on. I'm trying to write the the origins of humanity history and I just realized there is so many conflicting, at least two conflicting ideas. Um, basically, the main question is, did we, did we evolve here or did we go up in dimension or in, in densities then we fell then we went up so maybe that's our civilization is like uh it looks like it's um uh, already passed through several cycles of rise and fall rise and fall yes we have already passed several cycles of rise and fall rise and fall because we did not evolve from monkeys or primates that is a fake evolutionary status in the history books we did not come from primates so no, i agree they, with that did, did they come from us no they have similar genetic material that was taken from us to create them but they did not come from the human species per se they were genetically blended we are not their ancestors So why they are so similar to us? I believe that's very close, yeah. Genetic manipulation, that is why they're so similar to us. Because a bit of our genetic material was taken to create them. But we weren't created from them, as okay. the evolution origin theory says. That's not true. We, as humans, were seeded by other ETs on Mars, on Earth, other planets in the universe. Okay. Um, and a lot of genetic stock was given to us to make us what we are today. Okay. So, uh, why would they create the other monkeys? Because they hold their own integral um, part on being on this planet for the ecology, to sustain the ecology of this okay. planet. Okay. Uh, one why are we then uh, so similar to other mammals like in in genetics are they also created in parallel or yes yeah everything that is on this planet on earth comes from the same seed bank if you could say there's like seed banks mm -hmm. of plant life of animals of humanoid life and it's all comparable to each other to to it has to be, what's the word, in balance and in harmony. Like, that's yeah. why certain plants, certain species of animals, and certain species of humanoid, we are a humanoid species, mm -hmm. that were co seeded together at the same time. Because we have to be biologically similar to each other to be mm -hmm. able to exist on the planet. So we're, we're similar in everything biologically that was seeded on this planet. Because every planet um, has its own atmosphere, has its own land masses that are appropriate for the life that will be seeded on that planet. So it's specific to every planet. Not every planet has the same species, the same animals, you know, plant life, etc. Every planet is a little bit different in what's seeded on it that is compatible to that planet. So the species seeded on this world, the plant life, the humanoids, they are each compatible to each other to live on this biosphere of our earth mm -hmm. now uh there is a, a nice paradox there is like very many uh species of uh say animals i don't know maybe thousands of or hundreds of thousands i don't know exactly but there is only about 20 species of domesticated animals only 20 like we all know them there is there is no not a great variety of domesticated animals so somewhere i heard in the discussion the idea that each major species of aliens contributed their personality to our animals like sirius would contribute a dog and uh, 
liras would contribute a cat. Do you have any any ideas in that direction? I would say it's plausible that characteristics of um, ETs can contribute to the animal forms that they are most, you know, like. But animals are very intelligent in themselves. So mm -hmm. I think it's genetically possible to splice characteristics into animals of other ET species. That's true to a certain limited degree. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's about sentience of life. How far are you going to go genetically to create that sentience of life? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a domesticated animal? Is it going to be a wild, wild animal? How far are you going to go with this? Uh, related to that, there is a, a general observation that many of us uh, become intolerable to wheat. And uh, some people are just fine with wheat, right? And I think maybe it could be genes, like alien genes, which are in incompatible with wheat, or it could be just the level of vibration. Basically, wheat kind of grounds you. If you raise rise to certain vibration, you just can't tolerate it anymore. Like there was a, a funny, not funny, but interesting uh, observation, like on uh, Buddhist retreats, some people, when they meditate, they get crazy. So to bring them back to normal, they feed them uh, hamburgers and that kind of grounds their vibration, right? Uh, so uh, elsewhere, I, I heard that wheat is alien while other grains are, are, like more like from Earth, like uh, they evolved on Earth and wheat is alien. Do you have any clarifications on that? Well, for for my own experiences, I cannot tolerate wheat or grain anymore because mm -hmm. I do have that alien DNA component in myself that has been activated. Mm -hmm. Before I could eat wheat and grain just fine when I was younger, but the 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 alien genetics in me that have been activated, I'm on a higher vibrational frequency. And the wheat and the grain are on a lower vibrational frequency, so I can't ingest them anymore. They make me physically sick. Mm -hmm. It's called celiac disease. Mm -hmm. and it manifests in people. And some people just have, because grain and wheat that we have now is not the same as when, when you were born. It's not your grandmother's wheat and grain anymore. Right, right. It doesn't have, the, you know, it has pesticides now. It has GMO in it. Mm -hmm. So it's been tinkered with. It's genetic wheat and grain that's been genetically modified. So it's mm -hmm. not the same natural wheat and grain that you used to eat when you were a child in the 50s and the 40s, even right. in the 60s. So it has been genetically modified by the governments. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. no longer as healthy as it was before genetic modification because it was natural. Now it's not so much. Okay. That yeah, thank you. Uh, let's move on. Uh, the next question is, um, the I I was very interested in archaeology, a related question, and um, I went to different museums everywhere in America and tons of museums in Russia, and there are local museums which are have they had some control by the government, but there was a lot lots of local involvement, so. So I'm sure that their findings there won't censor it as censored as much. So it looks like everywhere on Earth there was uh, that prehistoric man which existed for about half a million years, which for a long time, for many hundreds of thousands of years, used the same set of tools, just exactly like for hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years they they had fire very primitive uh, arrowheads uh, and um, and few other very simplistic tools and they didn't invent anything else. So it was stable, static technology, very simplistic and they lived a long time. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> so why did we have that in museums? It was so convincing. Well, the thing is we built everything from metal, right? Right. If there's a catastrophe on the planet, like the deluge, you know, Noah's flood, all of that degrades. What's left over is not the advanced technology that we have, all the cars, all the cities, all the metal stuff 
that we make, that disintegrates. What's left is the stone stuff. What remains, what we make of stone, like from an ax, what would remain? The stone head of the ax. Because mm -hmm. that degrade, metal degrades quickly. In two to three generations, it's no longer there. But the stone tools remain. The wood and the stone is the stuff that remains. Mm -hmm. So we've had advanced civilizations. It's like the cycles. We've had catastrophic cycles where all that we achieved technologically was wiped out and we had to start from scratch, which is basically stone, stone age tools. That's all that remains behind of the advanced civilization. Because wood and stone don't degrade quickly. Metal does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's left behind in the museums is we, th we think of Stone Age technology, where it had advanced technology in part and parcel with our, with our uh, wood and our stone and wood technology. Because we use wood still today, and we use stone to create things. We also use metal right mm -hmm. so say if we were wiped out today what would be left behind four thousand uh, years in the future for those scientists to find i think uh, ceramic insulators and ceramics uh survives thousands of years that so, too so wood and stone would also survive and that's what they would house in the museums of our axes and stuff what we used to chop wood with you know, so it's, it's, it's like, it may be hard to believe, but like you wood and stone survives and so does the ceramics. Thank you. Um, the last question in that series I had, um, we, did we fall from the higher dimension? So were we seated on this dimensional earth or were we seated on a higher dimensional earth and then we fell? We were seated on a higher dimensional earth and then it fell. Hmm. Definitely fell. And it, it started before Atlantis even, and hmm. it got worse with Atlantis and Lemuria when that fell. So Atlantis was on this earth, not the previous one. It was on this earth, very much so. Hmm. But it's different archaeological ages. Hmm. Atlantis, for me, I remember Atlantis being around for 2 million years. Ah, and me. this Earth is more than a couple of million years. It's about 17 million. Ah. 17 to 20 million years. So Atlantis on this Earth for 2 million years. So the, yes. fell, the fall was before 2 million years ago? That's what you... The final fall was 20, 26,000 years ago. The final, final fall. Ah, so it was multiple kind of... How do you fall like... Is it like just a crowd of people shift here or the whole civilization or the whole planet shifts? What is transfers from the higher dimensional planet to the lower, to, to this planet? Catastrophes. No, what, and, what is transferred? Are the people transferred or the souls transferred? What is transferred? What survives of the catastrophes, what's left behind? Does the planet travel itself or just the people? The people travel, the, the planet is goes through a chaotic process of transformation. Okay. If it's a man-made catastrophe, say you're working with crystals and you're trying to mine the core of the planet somehow, or you, you try to work with the crystal technology in the pyramids, like you mesh that together and goes boom. Mm -hmm. That's what happened 6,000 years ago. They, the, the elites tried to tamper with the pyramids the, mm -hmm. the grid system, the energy vortex of the pyramids, and meshed it with crystal technology, and it all exploded. Okay. And all of our cities fell and sank 6,000 years ago. And that's where the top of the pyramid was cut off? Yes, I, I believe so. Um, and also, 26,000 years ago, they tried mining with Atlantis. They uh -huh. tried to do some mining of the core of the Earth, and it exploded on them. And it caused those catastrophes, man-made catastrophes. We're at this point again where we're trying to learn not to repeat the same old business. Right. Yeah, that so, part is very, very, uh, very clear. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Jim, do you have anything on that topic? No, I'm good. <laughs> I, 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 that's all I wanted to ask for this topic, but... Um, 
how much time do we want to, to, to go? I, I can go for longer. It's, it's up to you guys. I can go for longer too. What's Jimmy's it's up to you. You want to go? Oh, thank you. So let's, um, I guess, um, that comes together with the idea of um, dimensions and densities. Like uh, there is uh, that author, you probably know her, Ashayana Diane. That's how she spells. Ashayana Dean, yes. Yeah, when, when when I say it, nobody can recognize it. So I, I wrote Ashiana it. Ashiana Dean, I can recognize it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people who, who, who listen, the, the viewers. Um, anyway, uh, she mentioned or she teaches about different universes, like universe one, two, and three. And the ascension is the process of shifting from our universe, which is number one, to the second universe. And the fall is backward from the second to the first. And our universe is um, basically a third density and uh, the next universe is four density. And the idea is that we have here basically three dimensions and there we have like more, I don't know how many, say mm -hmm. four dimensions. So that's the idea. So three universes, one, two, three, uh, third density, fourth density, and th maybe I'm misinterpreting, but the main idea which is attractive to me is why um, why we see first and second densities here. We like I understand first first density is like stones and atoms, and second density is plants or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we are, say third, so all three densities are clumped together. We can see down from third to second and to the first maybe, mm -hmm. but we can see up to the fourth, so there is some whale. And the aliens there, I'm not sure they see seen us naturally. To see us, they have to kind of go through the whale backwards. They have technology to look through it or travel through it. So it looks like there is a, a whale, a separation between our dimensions and densities and their dimensions and densities. So it's not like just we, we are stepping up and up and up. It's like we're stepping up and up and up, and then there is a whale, and we have to kind of go through it as a as a leap, as a jump. So I invite your clarification because it's um, it's the teachings are very different on that topic. Yes. Um, well, her she teaches by energy. It's all mm -hmm. energetic levels. Mm -hmm. The way she explained it is that we rotate through cycles of dimensional shifts. Like you were saying, third, 3D Earth and 4D Earth, that our 3D Earth shifts every couple thousand years into the 4D. So on one part of the planet, we see ruins from the 4D when we're kind of 3D. And when it shifts back to the 3D, we see something else, ruins, that we might not necessarily see in another cycle. So it's dimensional shifts. The planet goes dimensionally, 3D, 4D, and backwards every couple of thousand years. So what we saw in one dimensional reality is not necessarily one. We'll see it in the other dimensional shift. Mm -hmm. So planet 1, 2, 3, and 4 can shift into different realities, if my understanding is correct of her information, because mm -hmm. that's what I was reading in book 1, mm -hmm. volume 1. And when the shifts happen, you don't necessarily see the same ruins and cities. When in 3D or 4D, you see something else. Different archaeological date stamps of, of architecture, of archaeology. In one dimension, it was one thing. In another dimension, something else. So that's um, interpretation of dimensional shift. It's based on energy. And we go through different cycles of that energy and how our brains evolve does matter and what we can see in the next higher dimension. How evolved we are energetically and vibrationally of each person, not as a species, each person has their own evolutionary form going on in them right now into what they could see beyond the veil, their mm -hmm. perception of a higher dimension. I might see it one way, you might see it another way. I might see fourth and fifth, you might just see fourth. It's up right. to you, energetically, how you are attuned and aligned in on your own little ascension process within within your soul, within your body. 
you travel to this to this higher universe all the time right so you, yeah. you you're there yes. very frequently so how different it is it is very different uh, i mean i last year i traveled thirteen thousand years in the future and i saw crystalline cities i was in a different universe i was on a different planet i was i was standing on a wharf uh it was made of crystal and i saw huge crystalline cities and parks and it was near the water that's of the l race so and it was very pure, very clean. They do have cities, crystalline cities, but there's no pollution. These people are clean. In terms of time, is the time flowing there in the same way as here? No. Time flow is so smooth. It's just so... There's no rush, no hurry, no problems. It just flows smoothly. Here it's a bit chaotic all over the place they don't jump in cycles between destruction and you know building their way back to um a complete technological civilization they work those problems out they don't have that up and down flux that we do in our timelines they worked it all out so there's no conflict anymore and they're in another universe completely it's not our universe there's no time flux out there are we shifting to that place or what, what what is our collective ascension where are we going we're beginning to prepare to do that hopefully where we don't have to jump anymore through these cycles of um man-made catastrophes that we've gone through we have to learn to stop polluting we have to learn to stop pillaging this planet and you know, stop working with these technologies that cause destruction. Until we learn that as a race, these cycles will continue. We have to get there as a race. And that's just logical thinking. So as what's, human beings. What's your time frame estimates for the ascension? Because some people expect it like really soon. And some people expect it like long time from now do you have any estimates i don't have estimates because it'll take as long as it'll take as a human race to stop the destruction first as a species you have to learn to stop destroying things on your own planets that's number one mm -hmm. number two is cleaning up your planet so you don't have pollution you don't have you know all this mess that we're in wars whatever political arguments, political disagreements between countries, have to learn, stop polluting, stop the wars, stop the destructive technologies. Learn to live as a galactic civilization. Um, I, um, I just say you speak like an alien. Because uh, I am an alien. <laughs> the aliens always kind of talk to us as if we were in charge of the whole planet. And really, like, we're in charge of our own mood maybe maybe you are so. in charge of your own planet because your voice <laughs> speaks of the energy that you wish to see me you are in charge it's right. just as a human collective you need to come to a point where you stop the destruction you stop the pollution that's number one lesson of ascension there are many different layers of lessons in ascension right. ascension is learning your life lessons stop destroying your world stop destroying each other stop destroying yourselves that's lesson one of ascension. And it's layered. It's little layers of lessons of ascension. That is ascension. It's not you jumping from your... It's not necessarily you jumping from your physical body, learning to do it in a light body. Basics of ascension. Learn to live as a galactic civilization without your messes. That's simple ascension process, beginning of it. Right. Baby so steps. The answer of everyone, like like humans would be i am not distracting i am not destroying i am doing best i can and still i uh it is not happening so so like i have a plan control basically what i do today tomorrow next few days and you know uh i recycle my my plastics right and i eat naturally and uh, i still drive my car so i contribute to it's it's very few things you can personally do to change things and 
really it's like the question um, of you know do i go on the streets and do demonstrations do i join some resistance or do i actually meditate and be in peace so these are the choices we have yeah and it's up to you as your own evolving individual to make that choice how will you choose what will you choose to help the planet in your own way because you are your example is important to the planet i think uh, everyone's example of of your who you feel you are as a human being and what you feel is right and wrong is very important and very effective in influencing other people in time mm -hmm. thank you guys i i wanted to ask another question which is very important for me so um about dying and ascension i i'm very concerned about sex life and uh sex love uh in in other areas of existence and for me it was like for, for a bigger part of my life it was number one center of my life right and i was very surprised to find other people who are not as centered on on the sex love but um, many people are right and now kind of i'm sure it, it, it takes second and third place so dying like after in the afterworld in the afterlife is there sex do you know do you have any intuitive ideas well you exist as energy after you die you exist as pure energy for a little bit until you figure out okay do you want to incarnate again on a planet in the physical and have sex you have to make your decisions you have to plan it out again are you going to reincarnate and experience the sex or do you want to remain energetic and sometimes manifest a body and then back to energy since you you know not all people might want to incarnate over and over on a planet in a physical form you might just want to be energy with the option of having a body then recycling that body back to your energy state you know so you're saying there is no sex life in the afterlife like in between the lives in the spirit world you can't really have well, sex if you want to choose to have a corporeal body for a little while and experience sex, you can do so, of course. Because your energy, when you die, you go back to energy. You are pure energy source of your own. You're an energy source. Sometimes the energy source will manifest a corporeal body and on, on a vibrational level, wherever you are, you might just have sex. That's a possibility. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. it might be a possibility I that yeah i believe uh, that in the afterlife you have free will as well even though your energy you uh, energy is what created everything so you can create your own body if you want create a body there and create a scenario where that might be something that you want to do but uh it wouldn't be the same as being in a corporeal body ah and thank you and how about the ascension after ascension you shift to that fourth density how is sex out there i'd say it's still fourth in when you're in a fourth dimension it's still physical when you're in the higher dimensions sex is energetic you uh -huh. blend your two you know you you have the capacity to create your light body and blend your energies with each other so it's not physical sex anymore. It's energy, soul connection, true soul connection on the energetic level. Your two of your energies intermingle, and it's just beautiful. It's mm -hmm. not physical sex. It's like, what's the meaning of the physicality if you can't share your telepathic experience with your partner? Right. Yeah, I think that it uh, sex is different in every density, but it's always meaningful and beautiful and uh very uh has a lot of sensation to it always no matter what form you're in i think that it is meant to be that way to spark uh the divine within that particular activity i me personally on this third dimension i don't understand human sex at all it's like two bodies slapping together for me i don't i don't feel the emotional connection with anybody that way that's what our alien friend is do from yael he said the same you know all your sex looks sloppy to me <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how it looks like to me from 
higher dimensional perspective. I don't understand. Most humans, I find some humans are very careless with it. They just spread it around and have fun with it because it's a recreational sport to some. To others, it's very deep and spiritual, and it's a deep connection. So you can't lump everybody in the same category because for each person it's different. For me, I don't understand it. For me, it, I haven't had sex in 15 years, so I don't get it. I, I, um, all right. Not um, compatible with people. I just don't find that compatibility, that spiritual right. spark. As, as you rise in your spiritual vibration, you just find that you know your desires change and your uh, you know filters and criteria change a lot. Mm -hmm. Right, but um, like for making a decision, like the main the main issue here, right? The main issue for a personal issue for ascension is. You really have to love ascension and want ascension. That's the main topic in all channelings, all communications. And to really go full-heartedly with that, you have to know, are you giving up sex or not if you ascend? Like if, if the future humanity ascends and goes into that crystalline, beautiful reality, are we giving up our sex or not? No, you're not okay. giving that up. You'll just experience it on a very higher degree. You'll, yeah. you'll be able to put in the telepathic aspect of saying to your partner, well, I'm feeling this. I want to show you how I'm feeling. You can telepath that to the person, that experience, and they can exchange that experience with you. So it's it's on a... Yes, like, I, it can be a very powerful, positive uh, thing if, if it's done with the right intentions and uh with the right feelings and intentions it's a very powerful divine and wonderful and energy creating uh part of life and it goes out into it connects with all of the, the universe in the sense that we all connect with the universe through our hearts and souls and that's part of the the divine connection and it, it just makes it more beautiful and connects people a little closer it's just that if it's not done with the right thought process, it doesn't mean much at all. So uh, the thing is, when it is done properly with a, a love connection, it's a beautiful and sacred and very powerful thing. And the crystalline body works a little differently than the body we have now. Um, a lot of the females on this planet are worried about procreation, like, oh my God, I just had sex, and if it was unprotected sex, I might get pregnant. With a crystalline body, you don't have to worry about condoms and birth control anymore, because your biological, you have more control of your biological process. The crystalline body will not have any STDs. The crystalline body will not have a period for the female of your species. Um, so I think we just went, okay, never mind. So you don't have to worry about birth control pills in a crystalline body. You don't have to worry about condoms, STDs, because your biological body is in control of the cycle. If you don't want to be pregnant, you won't be until you're ready and you release your hormones. You send a signal to the body, it releases the hormones for pregnancy. You have your biological functions are more, you can, you can send messages to them and say to your body what you would like to happen. As whereas right now in the 3D body, we don't exactly have that ability sometimes. We rely on um, condoms and uh, birth control to make sure you don't get pregnant, you don't get STDs, et cetera, et cetera. What's an STD? Uh, sexually transmitted diseases, oh, crabs. Gosh. Right, terrible, yes. Right. We won't That's... have that in the crystalline body. Uh huh. That will not uh, be there on that dimension. Another topic which kind of is close to that is the idea of procreation, right? For me, love was and sex was always connected to the idea of procreation. Like when I would express my love to a girl, I would say, I, I want to have children from you. That that's would be like number one idea. Otherwise, it would make any sense. And anyway, um, some people among our community, they 
don't have children and um, they can't have children by some by one reason or another because they just pass the age of procreation or they just are not um, don't have the infrastructure and the, uh, money and stuff to take care of the children so for them having hybrid children is is really emotionally charged it's kind of heals a lot of pain in their life they didn't make children in this physical reality but they created hybrid children in the alien space and for them it is healing and it's a lot of justification that their life wasn't um, a failure right so for many of them it is absolutely essential to have that so i invite any comments on the idea of hybrid children and the hybrid program well it's a worthwhile program to do if if you want to help your own species and help other species to advance in evolution, in ascension, that's a worthwhile program to give your genetic material to do that. Um, the question for me is, you know, who's raising that hybrid child? What right. is going on with that hybrid child? Before I would donate genetic material to do that, I would want to know what kind of a hybrid child it would be where it would be living, who would be raising it, you know, because that's important. Environmental um, aspects of how you're raised physically does influence your mind and your body and how you grow up. Absolutely. So those are the questions I would ask before I agreed to have hybrid children. Right. Have you met um, hybrid children, hybrid colonies? I haven't met children. I am in contact with ET adults, not children. No. Uh -huh. I know there are some even planets with hybrid populations in yes. Pleiades. Yes. Or at least are. small moons maybe, but uh, yeah. they live on, on the surface. They have colonies on the surface. Yes. I've met Arcturians that are hybrids, mm -hmm. ET human hybrids. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. They're a little bit shorter than the taller Arcturians. Their, their skin is lighter blue than the darker blue Arcturians, the tall ones. So they have more humanistic features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope to meet my children and m many of us hope to meet our children. Soon we uh, will have disclosure and we will be able to invite an open contact and we'll be able to invite them down here and visit their homes. That would be wonderful. Well, I have two children on Mars, a son and a daughter from a couple thousand years ago and they're still alive somehow ah. when i talked to Takir through jim i asked are my children are mars still alive and Takir said yes so this, there's a from this body or from previous body from previous lifetimes a couple uh -huh. of lifetimes ago but <laughs> these children have lived for a couple of thousand years i don't know how that's possible but my children are still on mars my two children. And they might oh, be in cool. very good physical shape now. Well, <laughs> the sun is, I don't know which one of them, I don't remember, was not doing so well on Mars. Ah, I see. I think it was the sun that wasn't doing too well. I see. But I hope one day I can go back to Mars and see my children. Very that cool. was from the time I was the gatekeeper a couple thousand years ago. What species are they? Human. Ah. They're from the human colony that was originally there on Mars. Jim, do you have any on that topic or any? Uh, I have another topic, but uh, I don't want, if you want to, uh, to uh, d develop this topic, well, you're I've, welcome. I've asked most of my questions. <laughs> ah. So uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the Agarthans, I, somehow Agarthans escaped our channelings. I don't think we have channeled as many Agarthans as others like um, I guess the main question is are we really channel channeling the aliens or sometimes it is local Agarthans pretend to be aliens they used to do that quite a bit mm -hmm. before but they're not doing that now because um, certain people have started talking about their garth and societies, about the nature of their existence and so forth and so such. So it's been disclosed about them already. So what's mm -hmm. the point of them masquerading as an ET? Mm -hmm. 
when most people already, those of us that are awake, we already, the channelers, we already know that they're here. So what's the point of them lying to us and saying they're ET? Their, their origins is ET as well from some point in history too. They might have come from a different planet here and settled here. Some of them may have been born here as original humans. Everyone is seeded from elsewhere in history. So we're all a little bit ET. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some are naturally born on this planet. Some migrate here or are seated here. So in a way, we're all ET. Okay. Another related question, thank you, is um, there is uh, basically the opinion that after open contact, it would be the Agarthans who would... Um, actively participate and will uh, share technologies and help us. Do you see that coming? Yes. Again, cultural exchange programs, like I was talking with Jim a little bit earlier about ET cultural exchange programs. Mm -hmm. We will have those with Agartha as well. And I cannot wait to go into their libraries and work there where the lighting is great. It's mood lighting, it's <laughs> fluorescent yucky stuff that's in yeah. most of our libraries right now. So I cannot wait when that day comes and I can just say, hey, sign me up for that cultural exchange. I'm going to Pagalthos Library in, um, <laughs> in Inner Earth, in Telos. Like, I want to go there. I already know where I want to go. Because I've been there a few thousand years before. I'm like, mood lighting is still nice. Nice lighting. I'm all about the lighting, so I I choose to go there. Yeah, I work with lighting a lot. Um, yeah, I um, I play with it and modify it. It's important. The fresh air for me is absolutely essential, and lighting, yes. And, me uh, as well. And now I'm turning off my Wi-Fi just you know one once in a while just to clear up the the uh, vibrations around. Yeah, my Wi my Wi-Fi is off at night. It is turned off. Yay. Like, Computer yeah. is off, TV is off, Wi-Fi is off. You need that clean energy to sleep. Open up your windows. Go outside for fresh air. That nullifies the effects of Wi-Fi or any other electrical transmissions you have from your technology. So Agartha Network is very good. Their technology is, some of it is bio-living, matter. They don't have what you call Wi-Fi here. It's not their their internet is not as ours. Of it's more biological. It's telepathic as well. They sit in the these little chairs in the library and they just create a holographic construct and go with their mind somewhere and look at you and talk to you that way. Not through just channeling. You can have a holographic experience and go to Agartha. Just like you go up to Girk Fitnir in a holographic type of a experience. Same with the Agartha network. So their, their communications is telepathic quite a bit because they're fourth, fifth density. All their cities are no pollution, nothing like that. Their water is clean. Their food is clean. Their animals, even the ones that are wild, that were predators, are still, they walk in the wild, but they're not predatory. They won't want to eat the human. They don't want human meat. They oh. are... They are um, genetically now not predisposed for that aggression factor. They don't have the aggression anymore. So would the cats eat mice or would they be vegetarians? I think they're mostly vegetarian, but sometimes they will eat meat that is, it's not actual meat, but it's simulated meat. Uh -huh. um, I have a few, go ahead. I have a few random questions which I just made, made a note, so they're not as related. Um, one was, you mentioned tall whites. I know nothing about tall whites. Who are they? Tall whites are a form of grays, uh -huh. but they are the evolved grays. They are not uh, robotic. They are not genetically messed with. Okay. They're very tall, and they have this whitish skin with long heads and very tall you can go up to 16 feet or higher how can you tell them apart from others 
And the distinction is they have almost whitish skin, very mm -hmm. elongated heads, and very tall, with big luminous eyes, tall whites. How different are they from Yael? Um, they are not genetically modified in any way. The Yael are hybrids, aren't they? Possible. We don't know. But looking at them, how would you tell them apart from Yael? They would be taller Bald. and... Oh, Bald. your Yael are a lot shorter. Yeah, no, tall whites are very tall and they're bald. Okay. I think so, yeah, yellow, some are yellow bald too, are they? Yes, but the tall, the yellow are much shorter. They're actually more just human size or smaller, whereas these guys are 16 feet tall. Ah, okay. And they're, they're good, right? Most of them are good? Yes, most of them are very good and they... They have healing, they have uh, teaching. They are, they've been here a long time on this planet. They've watched the governments. They've even um, intervened on some, on our behalf when the wars were going on, you know, Cold War, all of that. They intervened to stop that from escalating. So they are still involved in, in Earth. They are, um, things. they are very much involved in Earth stuff. Nice. Very much so. Um, just recently, like last month, uh, a lot of draconian energies came around. And I'm trying to restrict them, but they just kind of come and ent enter in every door. Uh, what, what would you suggest and what is your experience with draconians? Well, I was abducted as a child as by the Dracos. Okay. Uh, one of the species was black. The other one was yellowish green. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you if you want the drac to go away, just tell them go away. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with my energy. Leave. You have to tell them to leave physically. Get out. Whether you okay. sense it energetically or see them physically, just tell them you cannot do anything to me. You cannot. Whatever your plan was, forget it. Don't do it. I do not give you permission for anything in my house. Get out of my house. Get out of my energetic field. Leave. You tell them to leave, and they will leave. They have to leave. How about friendly draconians? Do they exist? <laughs> yes, they do. And, you know, if you want to communicate with them, you're more than welcome to. Uh -huh. So... The bad ones, you can instantly just sense ah. their intentions it's like ah. so creepy. you just feel it and then you kind of if it is a good draconian you can communicate with them right yes yes if it's creepy energy if you feel that energy that's that could be with any et species not just okay. draconians just tell okay. them if you don't want to talk to them tell them to leave or if you're not sure about the species tell them i'm not ready for communication with you just yet you know a little bit later let's talk a little bit later because I'm not ready yet. You could say that as well if you're not sure about the species and the intention. You okay. can put it aside for a while, that communication. Thank you. And uh, Nordics, what's your experience with Nordics? Who are they and um, are they mostly good or what? There's good ones, there's bad ones, there's a few different species of Nordics. They're not all the same. Are they, they look, looking like Swedish or yes. not necessarily? Right. Tall blondes. I call them just the tall blondes. Uh -huh. Some of them have five fingers. Some of them have six fingers. Um, it's hard to tell them apart from each other, but they're not from the same species all the time. Okay. There's different species of Nordics. So one of my um, uh, contactees, which I, ex which I interviewed, she said, I would rather be with a reptilian re than with a, with a Nordic. But she was kind of abducted and uh, was uh, harassed in military bases, and she said Nordics at military bases were, were the hardest, were the, the, the worst ones. Do you have any of that um, experience? Well, I had a Nordic type Cobra uh, classy assassin come to visit me and try to kill me and my cat. <laughs> He's a hybrid right. of Cobra and human in Nordic. So Cobra and Nordic, wow. Cobra, human, and Nordic. Um, but you know what? 
Not all of them are the same. Not all of them have the same intention. Okay. I mean, for me, I I had a, also a reptilian hybrid hybrid come and try to kill me as well. But, you know, I'm not going to say all reptilians and Nordics are bad because not all of them are that way. Yes, mm -hmm. Nordics and reptilians are on human basis, on this, you know, secret space program basis and the mm -hmm. military industrial complex. But I, you can't lump them in the same the same category because they're not all good and they're not all bad. So I won't, I won't say, oh no, don't have contact with a Nordic or don't have contact with a reptilian. I'll never say mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because some of them are not bad. Yeah, I really like uh, the Nordic appearance. It kind of uh, evokes some em very positive emotions in me. I like Nordics by some reason. I'm very attracted to that idea. And I like greys and uh, yayals. But uh, uh, it would be nice to know more. It's kind of very mess, messed up information. There is no clear history about that. I don't have you know? much experience with the Nordics. Mm -hmm. Well, so it's I'm... like anything. Uh, there's all different kinds of uh, personalities within every species. So you, it's just like the same with humans. You really can't pinpoint anything that's really the same same about them except maybe their look but their personalities are all different and their intentions are all different and where they come from is all different and how they're taught is different so it's um they, just like anybody else uh, and we, the, uh okay. we're all different in the lord of, of the rings there are elves which look like nordics to me remember Yes. Elf? Yeah, they, they, you know, I, I'm so in love with them, the whole race. The pointed ears, the blonde, yeah, yeah, elves, blonde yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah, blonde, yes. And there they, is also... Go ahead. They exist too. I wouldn't say they're Nordics, but yeah, Nordic? they're, I don't think so. I don't know what the species is called, but it doesn't feel energetically Nordic to me. Okay. And there is also uh, a new TV series from 2016. It's called people of earth it's about alien abductees and aliens it's a comedy sitcom television sitcom and i'm so so with, in love with the whole series and they're now coming with the second season and there is also a nordic word. there yes huh. and right. it's like they, they have their um they have their counseling group it's a counseling group where the, oh the yes, people of it, Earth. It's a counseling. Yes, you group. watched it, right? I haven't watched it. I've heard about it. Oh, There's this uh, counselor who doesn't really believe in the ETs. I think he's black or something. Um, he doesn't believe in the ETs quite. Right. He doesn't the believe hero, He's not a counselor, but he's a journalist, and that's kind of his awakening. The whole, yeah. the whole first season is his awakening, right? Yeah, and he starts believing in when he's abducted. <laughs> Uh, there is so many parallels there. Like you watch it, it's like very condensed version of our experiences. I, I, um, I ran a group of uh, abductee experience group in in Rochester, and uh, so so I was there. I was sitting in the circle and I was guiding it. Right. So so for me, it is <laughs> first kind of and ton, tons more of, of like and the relation with the deers. The deer there symbolizes uh, the aliens, and for me, the deer also symbolizes the aliens. I. I was meditating on deer. They were coming every day to me. Hmm. And it was kind of the uh, the gray energy coming. So there hmm. is tons more of parallels. I, I it, It's, yeah, let's watch it and exchange uh, what you find there. I, I don't energetically feel drawn to watch that one. It's just okay, not. Fine. Um, I'm in favor of support groups and contact groups for this type yes. of stuff. I think the more you share your experiences, the better. And you might find some commonalities and new friends. I just, for me, I'm like, okay, I have the contact experience. I I don't need to learn about that because I'm already doing it. That, that's a good show, People of Earth, for those that are starting to think about the idea that ETs exist and contact. You know, that show is great for them to to learn and to, to, to experience that idea, to begin to understand what it's all about. That show is great for... For to 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 think about all of these subjects. 
for me, I don't need to think about it. It just is for me. There was another parallel. Uh, there is, uh, I think there was like eight abductees or seven abductees in the group and one person who wants to be abducted and have never been abducted. He is like a forest researcher and have never been taken, right? That was me, right? It, it's another parallel which is so dear to me. Like, I am, you know, all into that. Take me now. And somehow they, they still wait, you know, until the future. And in the last uh, episode of the season, he has been taken. So he is absolutely happy. Hey, it's finally happening. There's positive abduction experiences and there's negative abduction experiences. So uh, careful what you wish for in your experience. Uh, yeah, I want uh, to, to visit my friends, yes, and, and children. Mm -hmm. So you already know what kind of experience you would like and you've already put it out there, what you want to experience. Because some people are like, just take me up. But they don't think about who's going to take them up, what is going to happen there, you know, what, what, what the experience would be like, setting the intention for the experience to go have a contact or a positive abduction, you know, that, that's very important. Yeah, I wrote a book and published it. My plan, how we will work together up there. So the plan has steps, and the main step is to start YouTube broadcast from up there. <laughs> that would be lovely. And the word abduction, I I prefer using the word contact experience than abduction. Yeah, visitation. Um, yeah. yeah, visitation. Because abduction... Voluntary, voluntary visitation. Yes, because abduction to me says kidnapping. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. no kidnapping. Yeah. Only voluntary visitation. Only with uh, con, con, how do you call it? Consent. Yeah, with the consent. A consented visitation experience. Informed consent. I want I, to be yes, no one who is taking me. No draconians, please. Not this time. I'm good <laughs> with the yell and friendly pre and um, and maybe Lirans. Yes. <sighs> All right. I think I'm done with my questions. Yes. Very good. And we have to go pretty soon anyway, so I'm I'm finished with my questions. Unless there's anything you would like to just add to the interview that would uh, give us a little bit of an ending. I'm good as well. I think we covered a lot of interesting topics today. I do too. It was very interesting. You're a fascinating person. I love talking to you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And it's just wonderful to talk to you. It's like... I'm I'm mostly the one asking the questions and in interviews of other people, so it's nice to to be able to to talk to a person who and you have your own contact experiences with ETs. You have it too through the channeling. Yeah. So Wonderful. I think you're already experiencing it in your own way. I'm experiencing them in a different way than I thought that I would. But I would definitely like to have a contact experience in the physical. So a very positive one, of course. Yeah. And would you, if you were to have a contact experience, who would you want it to be with? I think I would want to meet Takur first. Um, and uh, maybe Pen Tim and Tepe and those, these do. The people that I know best from Gurk Fignir, those would be my favorite and first contacts. Um, <clears throat> and I think that it would be a really nice little get together. Mm. Yeah, let's go so together. Already, I'm, they're already my friends. They're already my friends. I already know who they are. They already have their own personalities that have really resonated with me. And I love who they are. So. Those would be my first people that I would want to see. And how about you, Max? Who would you want to see first? Same and my children. Beautiful. He, Nina and Pat, Peter and yep. yeah, that's her, his and kids. Masha. And Yosha, yes. Masha, Masha, Masha. Masha, Masha, yes. And uh, Lakesh I would like to see as well. Yay. Excellent. But be careful about hugging Lakesh, unless he is in a spacesuit. Yes, Lakesh <laughs> is a, a character, but I love him. He's very cool. Excellent. Well, this has been a beautiful experience for me again to talk to you guys. 
All right, thank you. Thank it's you always very much. lovely to speak to you, and I always love being with Max as well. So Yay. it's been a lovely time. Oh, thank you so much. All right, uh, we are stopping the broadcast. Goodbye, our viewers. Uh, and um, do you have any announcements? I guess we invite more hosts for the show to press buttons, and we invite more transcribers. And thank you for those transcribers who are transcribing. I'm receiving wonderful transcripts these days. And uh, and today's today selections of today's uh, in interview would be also wonderful. If anyone wants to transcribe, write to me at to max at humancolony.org. And we started a new version of the site, which is now faster. It's hucolo.org, abbreviated H-U-C-O-L-O, hucolo.org, so you can take a look at it. All right. I, oh. I, that's all I have. Me too. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye.